It is my pleasure to introduce Rhode Island Secretary of Health and Human Services and former two-term Lieutenant Governor, Elizabeth Roberts. Secretary Roberts has long been an advocate for affordable health care and in 2010 was named by Governor Lincoln Chafee to lead the state's health care reform efforts and served as chair of the Rhode Island Health Reform Commission. Under her management, Rhode Island has been a leading state in its establishment of a health benefits exchange. Her statutory responsibilities as Lieutenant Governor included leading the Small Business Advisory Council, the Emergency Management Advisory Council, and the Long-Term Care Coordinating Council. Secretary Roberts served five two-year terms in the Rhode Island Senate from 1996 until 2006, and during her tenure in the legislature, she was known for being a leading activist on health issues, having helped to expand the state's prescription drug program for seniors, RIPAY, and coverage to more families through Right Care. Prior to entering politics, Secretary Roberts worked as a business strategy consultant, policy analyst, and health care manager. She has an MBA in health care management from Boston University. Please welcome Secretary Roberts um, this morning. Thank you. And um, I'm the non-PowerPoint person, so you just you get to kind of close your eyes and rest them after a, a morning of talking. Um, and I really am delighted to be here. Uh, this is, there are times when you come into a room, hey Jack, uh, and you go, this is a room I'm proud to be able to walk into and to know so many people and to have had the privilege to work with so many of you. Actually, many former constituents of mine in my Senate district in this room, actually. <laughs> the People's Republic of Edgewood. Um, so, and uh, actually, uh, I, I uh, Representative Tansy is here. Uh, Representative Handy, who is my state rep, is Senator Miller still here? Oh, and Senator Miller. So I have, both of my legislators are here, I just want to say. Um, but it's really great to be here. And I want to thank um, Kate. I really want to thank Linda, who has been somebody that I have respected throughout my government career and who I really look to, um, particularly when she pushes and challenges. Um, I loved Linda's description that we've been having good discussions. I'm like, that's true. They've all been productive. They haven't all been comfortable all the time. But that is part of what I really respect and need. Um, and it's something that the, uh, the Economic Progress Institute does so well. Uh, it keeps reminding us, keeps refocusing our lens so that we kind of don't lose track of what our purpose really is. So um, I really want to thank all of you. And I want to thank the people who are here. I, I want to. I think I mentioned in passing the board, but I know that boards often go unrecognized and are crucial to the long-term success of organizations. So I really want to thank the board members who are here. Um, I want to thank the governor who is, has left. Um, but I really have to say, as somebody who has um, toiled in the trenches of healthcare work for a number of years, that having a governor fully committed to this effort is going to mean that we are able to really um, sustain this work over time. You and I all know about the three month, six month, here we go, and then everybody drifts away, right? Or everybody says, I can just wait out this three months or six months because, and I, I'm very aware of this, that I alone, uh, inside government, along with my directors, even with the, my team of directors, um, if people didn't have the sense that we had leadership at the, in the State House um, on board, on the executive branch, it would be very difficult to sustain this conversation, and it's an important one to have. I also want to recognize, I acknowledge the legislators who are here, but um, especially right now, the legislature's role in vetting and, and moving this conversation forward is absolutely crucial. Um, they bring so many perspectives to the table, and it is very important, um, and as the governor mentioned, our um, actual budget amendment was submitted yesterday to the legislature. I actually have a call from the Senate president I received while I was sitting here, so I can't decide whether I should be really nervous or not. Um, but that, that, that you know, this, this process, and I've been on both parts. I'm not a lawyer, so I'll never be a judge. But I've been in both of the other branches. Um, that relationship, which can sometimes be challenging, is so crucial to our long-term success. So I really want to thank the legislature, and I want to thank them for their tolerance of a less than usual process this year when the governor said, look, I'm new. I know this is an issue I really want to focus on. Will you give me a little breathing room to convene a public process? 
uh, and submit a, a kind of a revision of my proposals around state finance health care um, a few months into the session. And I want to thank the legislative leadership for saying yes. And because, you know, that isn't, that isn't the way it usually happens, um, but it has given us the opportunity to start this work and to kind of get through phase one. Um, I want to welcome Cindy, uh, who I have, um, you know, if you're in this kind of work, you watch all of our partners at CMS. Um, I will say that, and, and I actually, I'm a little bit political here, but not totally. In my time in government, until the Obama administration, I would almost always hear CMS described with some version of frustration, anger, whatever. Every once in a while, it was a positive conversation. But usually it was, ugh. There was a big change that happened with this administration and the passage of the Affordable Care Act that said, OK, states and, and the federal government need to be partners in solving these problems. I give Cindy a lot of credit. I mean, she's right. Medicaid is nowhere near as cool to the feds as Medicare because the zeros are not as big on the federal budget side. But for us, that relationship with Medicaid, absolutely crucial. And that has been a much more positive series of years and partnerships that are putting us in a very good position to do some of this challenging work. So it's great to have Cindy here today. Um, and I'm going to do a little cross stitch in my free time of don't worry alone. <laughs> I think that's, that's one of my, uh, the best quotes I've heard in a long time because I'm very well aware we're not worrying alone and I'm actually quite comfortable that not only are we in Rhode Island not worrying alone, but in Rhode Island when we're worrying, we have a big group worrying with us in a very constructive way. Um, and, and I'm very glad to see that she is now with Manat, who we have the opportunity to interact with in other ways. And so I think there's a great um, chance for us to um, get our work done well. So I want to also remind everybody of a couple of things when we began this work. Um, that, that the governor stepped forward and has held to um, that we are not going to solve our problems through removing people from eligibility. Um, it was, in fact, true that there was a significant change made last year when we moved the adults that we had, the parents of our um, right care kids, back into the exchange. Into the exchange. Um, there were no proposals in this budget, nor were there benefit um, design cuts. So we didn't say no adult dental. Remember how we all wait for that proposal when we're trying to manage the Medicaid budget? We did not take categories of service and say, Medicaid enrollees, you don't get that anymore. We said to the systems of care, um, we've got to solve these problems, and you have the power and the influence, and we have, you know, we look at those dollars around hospitals and nursing homes. That's a lot of dollars, and that is where we spend a lot of our dollars, and that's how we need to solve our problems. Clearly, our consumers are part of that, but they should not be asked to bear that burden because they don't have le the leverage in the system that we have. Um, now, we need to learn how to use it. So my other favorite slide, and Linda, I need it because I'm getting a T-shirt with that horrible mix of Venn diagrams. <laughs> I want that T-shirt. I'm going to wear it, or maybe I'll just hang it on the wall in my office um, because it is true that we have a two-part process in place here. Uh, the first part pretty much left us with that Venn diagram. Now, what preceded that Venn diagram was worse, let me just say, than that Venn diagram, that messy Venn diagram. Um, but we were tasked with, in a very short time, trying to take a fairly traditional budget proposal and see what we could do to start to move some of our programs and policies more toward where we want to head in the long term. So it is, in fact, true that we have a very high proportion of our uh, Medicaid enrollees in managed care, but we have over time actually been um, kind of carving up those enrollees. So if they have some unique needs, oop, actually that one's outside of managed care, even though you're still in managed care. And we in government have um, run some of our programs so that this set of programs, particularly in behavioral health, substance abuse, developmental disabilities, is over here, but the rest of your body is over here in Medicaid even though there's Medicaid dollars here. So we are, in some of these proposals, starting to take the steps to bring some of those services back inside the managed care umbrella, for example, um, trying to really, and I'm going to go in through in a little more detail what we have in front of us, but it isn't a pretty picture. We get to have way more fun, might be the wrong term, but over the next few months, 
saying, okay, what should that picture really look like, and how do we get there? We are going to be um, sitting down and having, um, have, what was your term, Linda? Good discussions about where we want this system to go. Because there is a great deal to build on, but we also have some places, and one of the no reasons that, you know, that our hospital numbers are probably higher, or definitely higher than they need to be, and why that, high, I hate to call them high utilizers, but our people who have very um, high needs, and it is correct, some proportion that is an unavoidable um, occurrence. But the interesting thing is that when we looked and when we started to drill down into that data, the numbers of those people who had been at that same spending level for multiple years, that is symptomatic of failure in our system and not good quality. So how do we really take some really um, appropriate approaches and how do we worry along with others who are worrying about this and sitting on the phone with Jeff Brenner to learn about things he did that worked and didn't work in New Jersey with his hot spotting approach. Um, and really, how do we bring some of that best thinking into our environment so that we are spending and um, balancing, as opposed to rebalancing, both in our long-term care system, but also in our acute and primary care system, where despite our investments in primary care, we still disproportionately spend on higher acuity settings. It's also really important to remember, and um, this has been brought up and was just talked about in terms of our role in the market, but we now have more than a quarter of Rhode Islanders served through Medicaid programs. Now, those are varying types of programs, but it's so important to realize that this touches so many families in our state, but is also a big part of our healthcare marketplace. And I don't say marketplace in the um, Health Source Rhode Island moment, but in our healthcare market. So we need to be thinking about the people we serve, the institutions and organizations that we need to, we are sustaining in that work, and the ways that our, our participation in that market um, impacts or is impacted by our commercial partners, Medicare, um, and the ways that perhaps we can simplify some of this work um, by aligning when appropriate to what others are doing. Um, but the strengths that we have around our right care program, uh, around our primary care infrastructure, which is one of the best in the country and which we need to use as a foundational building block. The expansion of um, Medicaid, which I really want to thank our legislature for, as I watch states throughout the country who ha are struggling with this issue and seem unable to realize not only the economic impact of not doing it, but also the health impact for their communities. That, that in failing to do that, they are marginalizing a group that has been marginalized and will continue to be marginalized and bears a disproportionate burden in poor health. Um, but I want to, and I want to recognize um, Dennis Keefe and Ira Wilson, who are our co-chairs, and Ira said very well, and he said it several times, that we have a good system in Rhode Island, but we need to demand and we, should, and we deserve an excellent system. And we need to have those those uh, good discussions to really create what that excellent system should be. Um, but we have costs and, you know, we have, the, we have our great data, data arguments, right? So let's put the data arguments aside and recognize that we have a lot of money we spend on health care, whether you're a commercial payer, whether you're Medicaid. And whether we think that how we got there, it is a lot of money. And it is probably money that we want to make sure we are spending the best way we possibly can. And I am, for one, as somebody who is helping to manage um, elderly family members and is um, rapidly entering that environment, it seems like sooner, going faster lately, um, just because we have a disproportionate number of elderly people doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't create the highest quality system of community-based services, as opposed to justifying more expenditures in higher acuity settings. So I want to be careful that we don't use demographics as an excuse not to fix problems. To me, it's the ultimate reason we have to fix those problems. We have a lot of people over 85, the highest proportion in the country. How do we create, therefore, the number one system of community-based services and supports for those people to stay where they want to stay and not have barriers in how we determine eligibility and how we allocate resources in the system so that they can't do that? That's, those are some of the things we need to change. 
Um, so we have got our first step in front of us, that um, Medicaid amendment, or it's actually, yeah, I think it is, what is it? The Medicaid Act of 2015. It, it is online for anybody who really wants some bedtime reading tonight. Um, is it about 70 pages, Jennifer? 85, 85 pages. I am, have the blessing of not being an attorney, so I did not have to draft it. I just got to say what I, basically what I wanted it to say. Um, but you can read it. Um, Article 1, for all of you um, State House watchers, that's the actual line item allocations, will be available, I think, the beginning of the week, is my understanding from the budget office. Um, but we do have on our website, um, and Mike, I'm going to look at you, but I think that's true, the listing of the actual proposals, because to be honest, the line item allocations are incomprehensible. So you're going to want to look and see what the proposals are that we have made for amendments to this budget um, for consideration. And for people who really want to have fun, our budget hearing is on Wednesday at 1 o'clock. I will be there. It will be live on television as well. So there will be an opportunity to hear more about what the proposals are. Um, and that will be the topic of the next um, few weeks and an important topic. But it's really important to, to note that this is step one. This is not where we want to be. This is where we are getting in the amount of time we have available and helping to try and move ourselves from where we want to go. So I will also say that um, there wasn't universal agreement. We did not ask everyone to vote for and agree with what is what you see in, on that, um, in that amendment. But what we did attempt to do was gather information from as many people as possible, both in the working group, in public hearings, uh, in public meetings, um, to get as much as we could, both for use in this work, but actually you're going to see even more of that public input reflected in the, in the document that you see come out in July. So let me talk a little bit about um, what is in the package. I am not going to go through every single proposal. There are 36 of them, I believe. I'm going to talk about them generally with some level of specificity. 34, excuse me. But I'm happy to answer any particular questions when we come to the UNA, Q and A. So as was mentioned earlier by the governor, we have a proposal and um, the, the rate cut proposal for the hospitals. Actually, I want to thank the hospital association that came forward with a proposal to say, look, we've been working with Medicare on value-based purchasing, which is really says, you know, you're going to take a bit of a rate cut and then you have the opportunity through um, meeting certain quality metrics and ones around utilization to earn some of that back. They brought that proposal to us and we, our recommendation is that we follow through on that proposal um, and that we are going to work on some approaches that really help to lower utilization appropriately um, because as you saw here and as we've seen in other data, we've got a lot of avoidable hospitalization numbers in Rhode Island that don't need to be here. We've got a lot of avoidable emergency room use numbers that don't need to be here. We have a pretty high number on our psychiatric inpatient. Um, and so knowing that it's not just this change that's going to solve those, but they're an important part. And then we um, looked at that and saw it as a real opportunity to approach the nursing homes for a similar approach. To say, you know, how can we sit down and rather than every year, and in the, for the last five years, I think these cuts have been on the table for both those categories of providers, why don't we try and change this discussion so that we're moderating that trend over time and really working towards a system that's sustainable and the quality that we're looking for. Um, there is a, a proposal for a pilot coordinated care program. As we've heard today, there's kind of accountable care, coordinated, um, sorry, CCOs are, but based similar. How do we want to look at um, an approach that as a pilot looks at a whole population of individuals and is responsible for their quality and total cost of care. And do we want to see that as an opportunity here in Rhode Island? We suggest let's try one and see where it takes us. Um, that high utilizer conversation, we have a number of innovations going on here already around uh, community health teams, around home visiting and health at home for people who are especially high need. Um, and what we are saying is let's simplify some of those approaches because we've got a lot of duplication and overlap between managed care, provider-based, um, some driven by us as well. Let's come to agreements around some approaches and let's um, ins move the numbers that are being um, served up um, because we're seeing some real positive impacts. So how can we serve people even more effectively? 
Um, the severe and persistent mental illness uh, that we are really disproportionately investing on the hospital side for those in our behavioral health systems. And we are using the platform of the health home uh, to really try and shift some of that utilization and working with our, com our um, community mental health organizations kind of where they are. They, we, they will come into this process. And Maria Montanaro, who's the director of behavioral health care developmental disabilities in hospitals, is engaged in an active discussion right now with all of our community mental health organizations to focus on how we can start to shift that paradigm. And as many of the, we heard loud and clear from our community mental health organizations in our public, our um, four town hall meetings, that we have disinvested in them. Um, and they're right. We have, we are being drawn into the um, inpatient side. And fascinating that Butler Hospital expanded capacity with when we expanded um, our um, Medicaid eligibility, uh, and it's all full. And, the, and actually, Dennis Keefe, now clearly, in a, if you've got a system that's built on fee for service, that's not a bad thing for Dennis Keefe, heading care in New England. But he actually sees it as a sign of not where he wants to be. And he's very interested, as are others, in trying to change that, that paradigm. And we need to do that, or we're not going to be able to make the investments we need to make. Um, we are looking at administration of our programs internally. I'm guessing I could go around this room and spend quite a bit of time hearing stories about how the way we run our programs, whether that's breaking it up across departments within the secretary structure, whether that's complex eligibility and enrollment, whether, you know, there are all kinds of ways that we are seeing that we are not necessarily managing or allocating resources in a way that serves our beneficiaries. So we, you'll see a number of proposals put forward. Not all of them have big zeros after them, but, but they will, those zeros will grow, and also it will improve quality of service. And we are looking at um, program integrity, one of those things that gets a lot of people nervous. Um, our, U, uni, our UHIP system, our Unified Health Eligibility, I always forget exactly what UHIP stands for, but our new database for eligibility and enrollment is our partner in that. Uh, we are also looking to make sure that we are effectively doing our own utilization review for the services that we order and oversee. Um, and we're really going to look and make sure that um, people who are, in, actually I was on with um, Dr. Pablo Rodriguez a bit ago talking about the fact that actually we're a state which um, allows people entering long-term care perhaps to shelter their assets a little more freely than we might all like. We need to spend these resources for people who are most in need. So you're going to see some language in there, which is about how do we close some of those loopholes to make sure that people um, who most need Medicaid are the ones who are receiving it. So there was not complete agreement, as I said, about these recommendations. Um, there was agreement that we need to work on this. And I'm very proud that we're working on it in a quite different way, not a perfect way, but a much more public way. Um, the door of my office and the, the, these meetings are held in public. We are looking for input. Um, we are not walking out of a room with, with a proposal. We are bringing people into the room for our good discussions, our work, our um, debates, to try and put some proposals forward that will help us in the short term and most of all help us in the long term. Because these are this is an issue that is not going to go away. Um, it is especially as we struggle with our economy here in Rhode Island. Um, this is a big part of our budget. It is, we have managed some of it well, and we have not managed other parts of it well. So we need to deliver the best quality of service at the best cost so that we are able to continue to invest where we need to invest. So the other thing that was mentioned is that um, the governor has, uh, when, when she submitted the budget amendment yesterday, also submitted a letter to the legislature or to the legislative leaders around um, additional resources potentially becoming available today and where those resources um, she would see as most important to invest. And I think there is some overlap for people in this room on a few fronts because one of our top priorities, and this came through loud and clear in our town hall meetings, is around payment levels for some of our healthcare workers who provide some of our most important healthcare and are uh, least well compensated for it. So there is a proposal to increase from her to increase our reimbursements for our CNAs for community agencies. 
also a proposal to um, increase CNA payment for um, those who are working in nursing homes um, because they are absolutely crucial, a crucial part of our workforce, and they are not a part of our workforce we will be able to maintain, particularly as we raise the minimum wage, perversely, because that is a very important thing for us to do, because we have set our CNA rates so low, um, we're now about to start competing pretty aggressively with uh, Walmart for our workforce. Um, we need that workforce. They are, I, I was so impressed by their level of commitment to the people they're serving, and we have not rewarded that through the ways that we pay them. So you're also, um, the other proposal is around primary care, because as you know, there was a federal um, support for primary care that um, went away several months ago, and we want to make sure that we don't do anything that weakens our primary care system, which is such a fundamental building block. So looking back at the last two months, um, I will say, as many others will say, um, that I'm exhausted. Um, but I am very prepared for the next two months, which is going to be, I would say, more important than the last two months. Because it is what's going to set our path for, I hope, many years. And I really want to thank um, everyone here, but I would say even more broadly across our state and in our political leadership of our state, that when this story was told of right care and our health care reforms, that's been under Democratic governors and Republican governors. That's been under legislative leadership of quite different approaches in terms of priorities and ideologies. But they have recognized the importance of health care for every Rhode Islander. And it is what has allowed us to be a leader. And I want to thank you for your continuing commitment to that, but really to everyone's continuing commitment to that. Because it also gives me a confidence that in a few years, when the leadership of this ch state changes, however many years that is, when the people in jobs like mine change, um, that there is a continuing movement. Many of you may step aside, but others will take your place. We have a continuing movement in a shared direction. We sometimes take some different strategies to get there, but I really want us to make sure we maintain that commitment through this effort and through the coming years as we try and really implement change. Change is coming. It is, we in Medicaid, you know, we're a big part of the market. It's, we can, also can't stand here and let it happen all around us because it will start to, uh, we will have trouble standing up as the rest of the system changes. We need to be proactive. We need to serve our consumers well. And we need to make sure that we can do it in a responsible way, both in terms of quality and the continuing focus on quality and also the focus on value and sustainability of the programs that we are responsible for. So thank you very much. I'm really glad we have half an hour, and I look forward to it.